So now that I did some housekeeping things, I want to introduce myself. My name is Stacy Christian. I'm the coordinator of Inclusive Excellence in the Pride Center, and I'm very pleased to have you here today. This has been brought to you today by Inclusive Excellence, Dean of Students, Enrollment, Residence Life, and the Diversity Task Force. We're so pleased that you're here. We have today, and I, I can't see him because it's so bright, and I know he's near me, but I can't see him. Oh, you're over there, okay. This is Michael John Carley. I just wanna make sure you didn't go home when I was my long speech up here. Michael John Carley, there's a lot of things to tell you about Michael John Carley, and I'll tell you some of them. Michael John Carley received his bachelor's in arts from Hampshire College and his master's from Columbia University. As the founder and the first executive director of GRASP, the largest organization comprised of adults on the autism spectrum, Michael has spoken at over 100 conferences, hospitals, universities, and healthcare organizations. As the executive director of ASTEP, he spoke at conferences focusing on human resources, corporate diversity and inclusion, and he conducted numerous trainings and webinars for individual Fortune 100 companies. He has appeared in media widely, most notably in the New York Times, Washington Post, New York Newsday, The London Times, HuffPost Live, Newsweek on Air, ABC News, BBC News, Fox News, Chronicle of Philanthropy, I can't even say it, but it's philanthropy, The Chronicle of Higher Education, Psychology Today, Exceptional Parent Magazine, and I could keep going. He's been on with Terry Gross's Fresh Air. He has also been involved with um, writing uh, news for um, Huffington Post, Autism Without Fear, and he has published over three books and has, and has two other in process. One of them is coming out tomorrow. I'm going to let him talk more about that, or I'll be here for the three hours, but I want to introduce Michael John Carley, and let's give him a wonderful applause. Thank you, um, thank you Stacy, uh, especially for you know, the long bio. Um, sorry about that. Now, Stacy had talked to you about the fact that there's no breaks. I apologize for that. I can't take a break. Um, I feel in presentations like this as though I, you know, whether I, I deserve to feel this or not, I just feel like there's an enormous amount of information that I want to, you know, convey to you. I take no offense if somebody's bladder says, I need to be the first one and it's really embarrassing to be the first one to get up and leave a presentation while the presentation is still going on. No, you're a leader. You're absolutely creating you know, a path for others. Others will be grateful for you. And I promise you that I will absolutely not take any offense whatsoever. Um, so do what you need to do. I think there's going to be a lot of people coming late anyway. So you know, what, whatever your needs are, you know, please, we're loose. I'm, I try to think of myself as a low maintenance person. And you know, we'll just play this loosey goosey. And I just hope you enjoy yourself. Stacy obviously gave you a lot about my bio. Um, before we get into the presentation, though, just a little bit more about sort of where I came to this particular field from. I was a, a long time ago, I was a starving playwright uh, by night, but I had a really cool, stupid day job. I was a minor league diplomat operating out of the United Nations, and I was getting to work in such romantic hot spots as Bosnia or Iraq before the invasion. And what started to happen was that like many families, you know, across the nation, many families, maybe like you, for instance, I would ask who's an educator and who's a parent here, but I can't see the hands up, so it's just useless, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, but my, my then four-year-old son, or two-year-old actually at the time, started to display a lot of the same telltale signs that kids you may have experienced went through. There was a speech delay. There, was, um, uh, there were motor skills issues. There was clearly not the same to de desire to interact with peers uh, that other kids went through. And he would pick up, you know, there was no sense of imaginative play. He would pick up a aerpl toy airplane and instead of pretending to be the pilot and going vroom, 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 you know, here I am, you know, he would spin the wheels to, you know, see how it worked. And we would buy dog food in bulk because it was cheaper in the cans. And in our hallway in our apartment, he would build these like unbelievable pyramids. So it was like, you knew something was going on. Um, but you know, I'm an idiot like anybody else who you know, enters this field because it hits their lives. 
Uh, teachers are trained, clinical professionals are trained, but you know, parents, individuals on the spectrum, we're, we're the dopes, we're total idiots. And when this stuff hits us, wow, do we have a lot, lot to learn. Um, especially because there's so much garbage information out there um, that you have to learn how to decipher between that and the real stuff as you go along that little particular journey of yours. So somebody, you know, first starts off, you know, using words like developmental disability. Um, you know, that's a big mouthful for me at the time. And then as we start to move along and suddenly this word Asperger syndrome started to creep up. And just for your frame of reference, this is the year 2000 when this word crops up for us. And I promise you, back then, uh, the iconography surrounding words like this was a lot heavier and a lot more dirt-like um, than thanks to, I think, the, the efforts of all of us, or many of us, um, that we've improved upon that iconography a great deal. But the funny thing that started to happen was that because of the genetic nature of all this sort of stuff, the clinicians who were in charge of our son's care started to look at dear old daddy out of the corner of their eyes. And then one thing led to another. And he and I were literally diagnosed one week apart with both having Asperger syndrome. Now for him, this was wonderful because he would grow up and we would know that he grew up in an atmosphere where if he said the first thing that came to his mind without that filter of, will this hurt anybody's feelings, that people would understand and that people would know that there was no intention to hurt other people's feelings. And for me, this was an enormously cathartic you know, experience. I'm 36 years old at the time when I got diagnosed. And so finally, you know, I'm looking at all those you know, social banana peels on my resume and going, wow, I have a very, very different explanation for these now. When I was growing up, um, I was a little bit of a street kid, very loud, but people thought I was talented. And quite frankly, sometimes people thought I was more talented than I actually was. I know this now. And I know that sometimes undiagnosed Asperger's contributed to that. You know, it was like, oh, his eyes are moving weird. Oh, he's thinking, leave him alone, you know. Um, you know, and you, you do. Sometimes you do have certain abilities and certain subjects that really, really, um, you know, just hits you the right way, you know, and then you're just lost, you know, you're, you're, you're in that mode forever and people have a hard time getting you out of it. It's really cool if you're the person who's involved in that, I promise you. But for other people, they freak out, they go, oh, he's obsessing or he's panicking or something like that. I was one of the lucky ones though. Most of the mistakes that were made in terms of interpreting or misinterpreting my behavioral differences were made as mistakes in the positive iconography of being more talented than I actually was. And it wouldn't be until, you know, 25 years later, until after my diagnosis, until after learning about a lot of this particular stuff, that I would realize, holy crap, everybody else got slammed. And I didn't. I got praised. Whereas 99.9% .9 of the adults, you know, were just absolutely, you know, tied to cars and dragged along the roads for the same behavioral differences. It's a real teaching moment. And so anyway, um, what does that parent do? You know, you quickly go and you try and suss up all this information. One of the things I find is an adult support group in Manhattan, where I live. Where actually I live in Brooklyn, but you know, life exists in Manhattan and you live in Brooklyn. Um, so I go to this and I find out that there's like six grown-ups on the spectrum who attend it on a regular basis. There's like 12 to 15 in circulation though. And the group is being run by this really sweet guy named Harry Feigenbaum. And Harry is a grandfather of a kid with, with Asperger syndrome, but Harry's not on the spectrum himself. So I go to a couple of meetings and I'm trying to figure out, you know, all this sort of stuff, but I got to go back to Iraq. So, you know, I'm thinking, well, I think I've learned what I need to learn from this particular group. And as I'm leaving, the woman who was sort of in charge of orchestrating the whole thing turned to me and said, Harry's stepping down. Would you be interested in running the group? Long story short, obviously I said yes. And this was early 2001. And not because yours truly was any kind of a brilliant administrator or a facilitator. I'm really not. But simply because the guy running the group had the same juice as everybody else in the audience. We went from six people at a meeting to 45 people at a meeting.
We went from 15 people in circulation to 440 people in circulation in a time span of about 18 months. We'd hit a nerve of some kind. And the clinical term for all of this stuff is really just peer support. And it's a term and it's a, it's a method that has worked for breast cancer survivors or returning war veterans. Something that says, this isn't a group where I'm gonna come out of it feeling like a patient. I know and I trust that that person running the group, I don't have to explain anything to that person. They've been where I've been. So you don't have to feel like you have to be the teacher in a group such as that. So we were getting a lot of notice from the outside world as well. And I started getting speaking gigs um, all over the place. And it wasn't until one at the New York College of Medicine in February of 2003 in which, you know, usually you speak and then there's a long line of people that want to talk to you after the presentation. Usually, you know, women who are like, let me tell you about my son. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. Um, but at the end of the line, there was this guy in a really, really nice suit. Turned out to be David Tobis of the Fund for Social Change. And he basically said, what's your pipe dream for a nonprofit? And that was how GRASP was born. Uh, GRASP became very quickly the largest membership organization in the world for adults who themselves are diagnosed along the autism spectrum. Uh, if you're interested, check it out at grasp.org. Uh, and that was really how you know, my name started to really, really circulate. Um, and it really was the organization that was sort of like the right time, right message at the right time. Um, I'm getting all this credit for all this stuff that's going on and for GRASP's ascension. We had planned on going national in our seventh year. And we went national in our second year simply because, again, this was just right idea at the right time. <clears throat> for me, it just felt like I'm just sitting on the 50-yard line with the best seat in the house, watching this amazing thing happen completely of its own accord and just with a life of its own. And, you know, I don't really feel like I'm doing that much to, to see it, but I'm getting the credit. So. so from there, obviously, you know, if you're in the autism world, you write books. Um, you know, I have a Huffington Post column, which uh, is called Autism Without Fear. Stacy mentioned that. I'm a really nice guy as an executive director, as a speaker, and as a book writer. But with that particular column, I get to be the bad guy, which I really like, too, sometimes. So, um, But this particular presentation, which I'm going to give you here today. For those of you who work in the field, um, you might see a lot of the same markers that you've studied along the course of your study. What I would give to you, though, is that this is information that in all those years that I ran GRASP, and I left there in 2013, that was really the accumulation of listening to arguably more stories from adults after their diagnosis than anybody in the world. And again, that's not because I'm any great administrator, but it's because of the nature of what my job was. Uh, and it's really shaped by that. And I think that from, you know, I don't want to get too, too civil rights on you, but at the same point, there's, there was always a great parallel of when, um, after the slaves were freed, let's say, okay, and the abolitionists um, who were expecting, you know, all these hugs and kisses, um, you know, suddenly went to the slaves and said, we did a great job getting you free, didn't we? And the slaves were like, actually, we've got a few things to teach you about um, how you kind of handled things a little bit here. And there was a lot like that in the autism spectrum world, where we had some things to kind of hash out with what we call, and I hope you're not offended by this phrase, the neurotypical world. And the neurotypical phrase just basically meaning that, you know, we don't want to call you normal because normal to me is a, is a cycle on a washing machine. And if we were to call you normal, then we would sort of rob you of the capacity to be an individual yourself. Because anyway, um, so the new look at the needs of teens and adults on the autism spectrum. And here's kind of a brief outline of what we're going to do today. Uh, we have the setup, we have the situation on the ground. If you ask any journalist, how do you tell a story? How do you frame one of, one of, one of your segments? Um, they will always say that the first thing you want to look at is what's the situation on the ground? What's happening at this very, very minute? And then the next step to that story is what's the history? And we're going to look at a very brief history of autism and kind of how we've handled this stuff in the past. Um, and it's a very, very ugly, ugly, ugly story, which is amazing considering the most economically solvent nation on this planet that we were at the time. I think we still are, but maybe not as so much as more. 
But and then we're going to look at some myths. We're going to look at uh, some of those older ideas about, you know, what autism constituted and have some fun with how those got kind of smashed up. And then we're going to look at some potentially redundant charts. Um, I hope they're not redundant. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at, let's say, one characteristic of the autism spectrum. One of those bullet points where, you know, the sort of psychiatric fast food feeling where you hunt it up in the DSM and it usually has like this really kind of cold stigmatizing uh, description or definition. And we're going to look at that definition. And then in the third column, we're going to look at a very crunchy granola, hippy dippy, feel good uh, definition, which is a little bit different. And we're going to talk about what the effect is on the individual if we understand that when we interpret a behavioral difference that we have choices. And then after that, we're going to talk about some side issues. We're going to talk about socialization, sports, families, work, sex, disclosure. And really, I think my intention with these particular side issues is just to give you a teaser. Because quite honestly, I could talk for five hours on each one of these subjects alone. They're very, very complicated when it comes to the spectrum. And so hopefully this will give you an idea of, you know, and not satisfy you but it give you, give you a sense of how much further we could go in exploring the complexity of these, of these uh, side issues. And then we will do uh, a closing, just some big picture ideas to kind of close out the presentation, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for a Q&A session. So what is the situation on the ground? Well, number one, we have the complexity of the spectrum and the DSM-5. Uh, DSM, for those of you who don't know, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's kind of like the giant Bible that the shrinks use to say, wave their magic wand and say, bling, you know, you have uh, Asperger's syndrome or bling, you have autism. Uh, and there was a great deal of controversy a couple of years ago over this new edition because they changed the definition of autism. They got rid of the term Asperger's syndrome, uh, pervasive developmental disorder, and they've lumped everything, almost everything, we'll talk about this in more detail later, almost everything just under the giant umbrella term of autism. Uh, but there's also the complexity of the spectrum where um, one thing we're also going to talk about is that how in the autism world we fight, okay? We have our controversial topics and we go at it. This is not the world of Down system, sy syndrome or, let's say, cystic fibrosis, where you have one unifying national nonprofit that everybody agrees with and goes on walks with to, for raising money for research in the consensus filled atmosphere of shared goals. Okay? We don't do that in the autism world. We have thousands of organizations, and we fight over certain controversial topics. And part of the reason why we do fight is because while there's a clear picture of what pops into your mind when Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis pops up, that is not the case with autism, especially not today. Um, I certainly, as we'll talk about, you know, with the 1994 uh, di you know, definition of Asperger's syndrome finally becoming legalized, uh, would never have prior been thought of as qualifying for an autism spectrum diagnosis. But a lot of things have to do with the context of that, the first of which was I didn't present like this when I was a kid. Um, and the second of which is that, and the bigger point really is just that if somebody like me, or let's go even further than me, let's go into the territory of all these famous people being diagnosed in retrospect as being on the autism spectrum. Albert Einstein, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Edison, Emily Dickinson, Beethoven, Mozart, long list, long, long list. And you're supposed to tell the average Joe on the street that these people have the same diagnosis, but just to different degrees, than somebody who may be nonverbal, might have to wear a head restraining device to protect themselves, adult diapers because they don't have physical bladder control or an awareness down there, and who have to live in a home and who might never ever have that job to make them you know, feel a sense of purpose as they wake up, even to just stock boxes for a couple of hours a day, or God forbid, an intimate relationship. We have to tell everybody that these two dramatic extremes are simply different variations of the same condition. Now, I'm not a clinician, so I don't get into the is this right or is this wrong sort of thing, but I certainly recognize that this is very hard for people to swallow, okay? We like to compartmentalize. It's a very human trait. And while I recognize that it's very, very difficult for people to be able to understand that there can be such complexity in any given condition like this, 
you know, where one end of the spectrum desperately needs services that it's not getting. And there may be another end of the spectrum that desperately needs to get rid of the services because it can handle things just fine without them. It just doesn't know that yet. In essence, if it is forcing us as people to not to need to compartmentalize so much, to be more flexible and more open, then I kind of think actually that that's a, that's a good thing. I, I can support that a lot easier, but it's hard on people. We also have nowhere near adequate school placements available. Okay, this varies. One of the things I'm learning is, you know, how different it is in the Midwest, um, let's say, you know, not just Wisconsin, um, than where I come from, which is the Northeast. But it's always going to be about money, and it's always going to be about school budgets, and it's always going to be, and, you know, Wisconsin is certainly experiencing that right now, and we might talk about that a little bit later on. <laughs> yeah. A plethora of butcherous clinicians. What does that mean? Um, in general, it really means that if uh, one of my guys at a grass support group um, needs a new therapist, uh, if they were to just, let's say, call up a therapist, cold call through the white pages, not that we do that anymore, but, um, and just say, hi, I'm a guy with Asperger's and I need a therapist. Do you know much about Asperger's? And let's say that therapist has read, you know, the one page description in the DSM. And, you know, they're thinking, I got a slot open, you know, I need, you know, an extra payment on my third home or whatever, you know, sure, I know my Asperger's, okay? So that guy goes there. Irreparable damage can happen from some, such a relationship. Because just as that spectrum individual might need to be taught differently in a special education setting, so too will those spectrum individuals need to be treated differently in a therapeutic setting. If you're looking for a reference, um, for somebody in your particular local area, get references. Don't just cold call. Um, your local autism societies are usually the best bet. You have to understand that because we've done such a great job with all this autism awareness, okay, um, this is arguably the creation of its own economic market, this autism market. So, you know, it is an area where you have your charlatans, you have your snake oil salesmen, um, you have all of these scum of the earth types, you know, that want to sell you on chelation therapy or, you know, hyperbaric chambers, you know, using the word cure left and right and stuff like that. There's a lot of crap like that that goes on in our autism world. One in 48. These are the new numbers um, as defined by the CDC. And... The question is, when are these numbers, these prevalence numbers, going to stop rising? And the answer is, we don't know. You could argue that since most of the CDC, when they do these prevalence studies, since most of the studies are based on eight-year-old children, that we really maybe need to look at some of the, the older, you know, like senior citizen uh, types, because we're not really going to know what that true number is until we've diagnosed a lot of those people who missed diagnoses. Now, this is kind of like a warehouse that needs to be cleared out because, you know, one of the things that we know about all this autism knowledge is that it often takes a while to spread. It starts out in, you know, clinical Disneyland like New York City or, or Los Angeles, okay? And then it slowly winds its way, you know, into, into the heartland of America. And then finally, on that final day in which information is actively, collectively, you know, consumed by Americans, uh, Becky Sue on the farm in Iowa finally reads that, you know, article in the Farm Journal about Asperger syndrome, and it's the first one she's ever seen, and she reads that, and she goes, Bachelor Uncle Fred! This is Bachelor Uncle Fred, I'm telling you! Okay? And so Bachelor Uncle Fred <clears throat> finally gets that diagnosis that could really, really help them out and also clarify what those real numbers might be um, in the future. The problem is that there's another factor going on, which I think is going to increasingly lead to these numbers not slowing down. And that is that if we, because of all this autism awareness, are becoming more of a behaviorally pluralistic society, if those aren't words that are a little bit too big, um, where the average Joe isn't going to freak out when, you know, some kid flaps his arms in a grocery store. If we're allowing all of these behaviors, and that's how autism is, tra is translated, is through behaviors that are different. If we're allowing more and more of these, what that means is that more people on the autism spectrum are being allowed a piece of the figurative American pie. 
They're allowed to go chase the same dream. And what you'll start to see then is people on the spectrum getting more jobs and working in society. And what you'll see then is if they have jobs, that means that they can afford to have livings and God forbid date. And what you're gonna see then, you know, eventually is we're gonna procreate more. So I don't wanna give you any one of these, you know, we're taking over the world you know, kind of scenarios, but you know, there's a little bit of truth to that. What's out there for adults? Um, especially here and in a few other places around the country, I would say that what your average parent goes through to obtain the school services that their kid needs in the autism world is pretty horrific. Um, it takes an enormous amount of effort. And the problem is that it's Disneyland compared to what's available for adults right now. Um, and especially here in Wisconsin, I think that the situation is actually quite dearth when it comes to what is out there in terms of services for adults on the spectrum. We have problems. Again, I talk about, you know, the fights that we have in the autism world. Quickly, for those that I can actually see, I would like to see three people tell me what the first word was when you saw this picture that popped into your mind. Three people. Yes. Hmm? Meltdown. Somebody else? Say it again. Sensory overload. One more. Say it. Sleeping. Well, the eyes are open, but all right. Um, this is indeed a picture of a woman named Amanda Bags. And Amanda is a nonverbal individual on the autism spectrum. Um, she does not have the power of speech. What she does do is she blogs through a communication device. And Amanda is one of these really highly politicized um, human beings who, if you're an executive director in the autism world, she can be a giant pain in the ass, okay? She certainly was to me. Uh, but Amanda is also somebody that you can learn a tremendous amount from because she is clear, she is articulate, she is politically astute, she is aware. Uh, Amanda is amazing. And in order to sort of steer you down that path, I want to read you what Amanda says about this particular photograph of Amanda. This is what I look like when I'm trying to relax or zone out a little or shut off vision so that I can hear what is going on around me. I have no doubt that someone could use this image to show the tragedy and despair inherent in autism. Black and white images such as these and the captions that go along with them are designed to create a reaction. Most often, disability organizations run by non-disabled people use them to elicit pity and money at the expense of the truth. Look at the autistic person in her own world, they say. Isn't it tragic? What I am doing in this photograph is no different than someone curling up with a good book to unwind after a long day. Some autistic people would even say that it's bad to publish pictures that look like this. Better to publish the ones that make us look like real people. Those are the better pictures. I say that plays straight into the hands of people who think there's something wrong with the way we look. Now, does this mean that every nonverbal individual has the same capacity as Amanda to hop on one of those devices and blog so brilliantly? No, but it does, I think, give you a small indication of the fact that there's probably more out there than we know of because we don't consider these individuals to have that kind of ability. And we don't really give them a chance to show whether or not they have that kind of ability. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the medical ethics of uh, I can't see it so it doesn't exist thing that happens an awful lot in the autism world. And on the other end, here we have one list of very famous folks that have been diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. And this is a list that I grabbed just from three books, okay? There are more books that diagnose more and more people as being on the autism spectrum from history, okay? Now, is diagnosing the dead an exact science, you know? Um, no. Uh, however, two things. Number one, if you were that famous, people kind of wrote about your behaviors fairly significantly. But number two, it's an arbitrary diagnosis for the living. 
We have to remember that. We don't get this diagnosis because of an MRI or a blood test. We get it based on an arbitrary interpretation of behavioral differences. And in that particular sense, um, I also, however, before all these names started to come about and like right around the time when I was diagnosed, the highest level of achievement you could think of for an individual on the autism spectrum was working the cashier at the gift shop at the local hospital. And even if my guys and girls in those grass groups have no chance, okay, of being this successful, no chance whatsoever, it's hope. And also you're not making the ethical mistake of sacrificing the possible in the name of the probable. We always make ethical mistakes whenever we sacrifice the possible in the name of the probable. This is sort of a little artistic rendering that I did of our world. It's not very good, I know, but I'm not that artistic anymore. Um, <clears throat> what I would tell you here is a couple of things about this chart, because this is obviously meant to give an indication of what the autism world kind of looks like in terms of who's out there and you know, what the organizational sort of you know, genres look like and what have you. And what I would tell you is that I have um, actually done great work in the context of budgets. The planets are very, very much in line with what the overall organizational budgets are of those particular types of organizations in comparison to each other. Um, now, I know it's sort of a judgmental term and very militaristic, you know, to say procure, but I just couldn't really come up with another word for it necessarily. But research organizations that were, that were, you know, used that word in their language and that said that they were dedicated towards finding a cure for autism. Um, and we had vaccine theory organizations on one end over there too. You have a little bit of a problem with that here in Wisconsin. Back east, we don't allow that anymore. Uh, on other places, we don't allow that anymore. That's still a little prevalent here. We gotta work on that. Oddly enough, national parents organizations were getting pushed out of the picture. And so that's why you only see half of that particular globe and regional parents organizations were definitely making their forefront into the picture a lot more. They were having a bigger impact because they were focused on their local communities as opposed to, um, you know, supporting a national office so that the national office could, you know, have employees to support. Um, now, you also had what we call spectrum-friendly research organizations, which I'll talk about in terms of what we do with research budgets a little bit later on. And, but what I will also tell you about this picture is that this is emotional manipulation personified because I have put all the organizations I like into the light, okay, including my old organizations. And the, the organizations that I don't like look like the Death Star from Star Wars, okay? So, um, but I also want to show you in the next slide a picture of who gets along with whom in the autism world. So, we're a little bit like fourth grade, we get it. Um, I would say that as I maybe have this tone that says that I'm mocking all of the fights over the controversial subjects in the autism world, I actually really do believe in confrontation. I believe in it very, very much. I think that how we confront has been handled terribly, absolutely terribly. But to say that you know, we need to avoid the confrontation I think is absolutely wrong. I think it's one of the reasons why a lot of very necessary arguments and very necessary battles were swept under a rug for 30 years when we could have been having them out and we could have been a lot further along in our progress. It's how we confront that will be the measuring stick as to whether or not we succeed. Here are the fights we fight about. We fight about language, okay? We talked about that word cure. We also b battle about the vaccine debate, okay? In other words, for those of you who don't know, did you get your autism because of genetics or did you get your autism because of uh, vaccines? which, you know, usually the combo shot when you were two years old or something. Um, we fight over things called aversives. And for those of you who don't know what aversives are, they are basically the methods by which if you work in one of those residential facilities, when some nonverbal 400 pound guy whom nobody knows what ticked him off because he doesn't communicate too well, and he comes at you just ready to just bury you with a right hook, absolutely bury you. What are you allowed to do to restrain him? And you'd be surprised because there's a lot of things which would throw your ass in jail if you tried it in real life that are perfectly legal inside these institutions. One of the things that I discovered early on in my, you know, when I was running GRASP in New York State was New York State put across this legislation that when you first looked at it, it sounded great. 
and I was ready to put our organizational stamp of approval on it. Um, because it had something to do, it mentioned some of the things that were, believe it or not, legal at the time and may still be legal in New York State. Strangling, kicking, withholding sleep, withholding food. A lot of times states like New York and other states like to uh, go even further and ship their kids at 50,000 a pop to a place in Massachusetts called the Judge Rottenberg Center where they shock the kids. They attach, you know, stuff to their belts, and if they do anything wrong, and there's a lot of serious mental trauma that happens over a prolonged period of time to somebody when you're constantly exposed to that sort of stuff. Um, now, what that New York legislation actually was saying and wanted a pat on the back for was that the new legislation made sure that nobody was going to be allowed to apply two of those previously mentioned diversives at the same time. That was what they wanted a pat on the back for. They could still strangle, they could still withhold sleep, but they couldn't strangle and withhold sleep at the same time. Wow, what an improvement. So that's what those aversives are. The problem here is that nobody has an idea of what an alternate way of handling those situations could possibly be. Because the only other answer is you medicate the crap out of people to the point where they're zombies. And when do you stop? For the rest of their lives? Is that an answer? It's really hard, hard, tough stuff. Whoops. Come back. There we go. So cool under pressure, wasn't it? I didn't panic or anything, you know? Um, research. OK, we used to be of the age where we would say, oh, autism research. That must mean it's good and we've grown up a little bit. There really are three different types of autism research, just to make it an easy compartmentalization here. The very, let's say, procure stuff that works on serotonin levels or nerve synapses where real scientists um, are needed to take part in this particular type of research. Uh, that is actually really valuable stuff because even if they don't come up with a cure for autism, what you're going to find with that particular type of science is information that will, late, re, will re, relate excuse me, way outside the autism world. That's the sort of stuff that's going to teach you about the brains of Kenyan farmers or the brains of Dutch shoemakers. Okay? It's stuff that will carry a long, long way even if this goal of this pill or this ability to spot the genes or the combo genes, you know, that make up autism that we still don't know about into something where, you know, God forbid we should be able to spot it like Down syndrome and then, yes, kind of figuratively have our cure in the ability to terminate a pregnancy if we're able to come to that day where we can spot an autism diagnosis in, in, in before, before coming to term. Um, this particular type of research, okay, which it's like, okay, fine, you know, the science is good. Even if the intent might be bad, I, I hear you. The science seems like it's worth it. Go for it. But do we really need to be spending like 96% of the available autism research funding on this particular type of research? I would say no. The second type of autism research is the educational um, and sometimes behavioral strategies. Um, herein, I would say actually we need to spend nothing more on this particular brand of research. And that's not because I have anything, any problem with it. As a matter of fact, it's great stuff. Our issue right now is finding the funding to implement already existing uh, innovations in educational strategies and behavioral strategies into the schools that we have right now. We can't find the money. We're getting a big backload of cool, cool ways to handle certain behaviors in schools but nobody's got the money, basically, to put this actually into the schools. So all this knowledge, you know, we can just keep building up. But, you know, it's the tree falling in the forest. If nobody's going to use it, why do we keep doing this? The third type of research is the basic life stuff. How many people out there with autism need housing? How many people out there with autism are diagnosed with autism as opposed to Asperger's? How many people out there with autism need a job? Okay, this basic information gets less than 1% of the, of the available financing right now. Okay, and that's the stuff that I think is really helpful because that's the only area where we're really helping, I think, the living. 
All that other stuff, the serotonin levels, that's not going to help your average working class family with a child with autism for 40 years. Okay? So if you hear of one of those research organizations and they're conning families into going on their autism walks with the phrase, this will help your child, proper response is bull. That's a lie. The first ever congressional hearings on autism, that's not really a contentious issue, but if you ever did want to see the comedy that this can turn into very, very quickly, um, Congress's first ever hearings on autism were in late 2012. Uh, I was one of two people on the spectrum to testify at them, but really for the first three and a half hours, uh, Congress just berated uh, the Centers for Disease Control officials. And the CDC officials just kind of took it. And it was a circus that is just, you know, you, you just can't believe it. If you're interested in it, it's on C-SPAN. Um, our testimonies, everybody else's testimonies are still on there. And there were some whack job testimonies as well, dare I say it. Um, but it's very interesting, you know, I mean, I know that Congress is like a really easy target, you know, to make fun of. I mean, obviously, we do it all the time. Um, but it really is amazing when you're testifying before them because there's, you know, what the C-SPAN cameras don't show you is that you're testifying to empty seats. They took off, okay? They come in, they ask the committee chair, hey, can I say a few words? And then they get a chance to just go, you CDC officials, you disgust me, I'm so sick, blah, blah, blah. And then they just leave, they take off. It's really amazing. It's really, really amazing. And then we had the DSM-5, okay? Um, DSM-5, uh, well, let me start it this way. The architect of DSM-4, which came out in 1994, is a guy named Alan Francis, and he operates out of Duke University. Alan Francis, in his column in Psychology Today, did not waste one opportunity to trash both the findings and the work habits of the DSM-5 committee. And everything started to unravel around the subject of autism when Fred Volkmar of Yale uh, basically said, uh, I'm leaving the DSM-5 committee because they're lying to the American public. They're saying that there will be no loss in diagnostic services with the new definitions, and that's simply not true. And I've done studies to show that there will be a loss of services. Now, Fred was... Uh, doing something in the clinical world that you're really, really not supposed to do. And what it started was this very ugly, very public war amongst the autism portion of the DSM-5 committee, uh, in which they all just started, you know, slinging mud at each other in a very public forum. Um, it does look like Fred was right, um, especially when you look at previous diagnoses of pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, which got classified into a thing called um, social communication disorder, which provides no services whatsoever. So right there, you had a problem, and I don't have the brain power to be able to go further into what was wrong with the other definitions. But in essence, um, for me, from where I was sitting as somebody who runs GRASP, I've always kind of felt as though you could always have an argument about, you know, the, the diagnostic criteria that was being debated back and forth. However, let's not go too, too far because we also, as a society, need to have some faith in the overall clinical community. And when they took to the airwaves to just trash each other uh, during this particular period, we lost a lot of that. And I think that it's contributed to a lot of the diagnostic anarchy, if I can put it that way. Um, that we see today, where everybody feels, you know, more than capable of diagnosing themselves. Which the may be possible, but um, at the same point, I just don't want it to be the overall policy. So, so anyway, we fight. Why do we fight? We're going to take a look. In 1943, a guy named Leo Kanner, who was an American child psychiatrist, identified autism. The things that Cantor was looking at was an inability to communicate verbally, a preference of objects to people, a disliking of breaks in routine, and high intelligence. Remember that one. Remember that one. And just one year later, across the pond, a guy named Dr. Hans Asperger identified Asperger syndrome. And the thing that Asperger was looking at was 
an inability to pick up nonverbal communication, passionate interests, motor skills deficits, and an oddly exhibited use of the spoken word. Now, don't think about this too, too much because I'll lose you. I'll never be able to get you back. But what do you think all this stuff was characterized at or interpreted at before the 1940s? It's fascinating because if you look at, it, when we're talking about autism as behavioral differences that can get you a diagnosis within the context of a certain culture, okay? I can show you places around the planet where some of those autism behavioral differences don't really strike people as being that odd. And there are other times throughout history where, you know, the cultures are just so different that some culture might say, you know, oh, he's the weird guy, kill him now. And another culture is going to say, oh, he's the weird guy, let's make him king. Okay? It's fascinating. And again, you know, every one of these behavioral differences that we have passes through cultural filters especially when it comes to one of the, you know, the great, great landmarks of a potential autism diagnosis, which is a difficulty with socialization, okay? I have had not one, but two Chinese American friends basically say the same thing to me with the same words. I don't understand what a lot of this socialization thing of yours in the West is. I really don't. My parents just cared if I was smart and if I worked hard. That's all they cared about. So, it's fascinating stuff, but again, like I said, let's, uh, let's get back to it, otherwise I'll lose you. So, what happens after both of these diagnoses are concerned, or not diagnoses, but identifications of new conditions happen, is that Kanner's work spreads, but Hans Asperger's work does not. Why? Well, obvious answer is that there was this world war, and Hans Asperger was working under the auspices of a Nazi occupation, whereas Leo Kanner was working for the Americans, who won the whole thing. Okay, and after the war, everybody wants our music, everybody wants our blue jeans, everybody wants our automobiles, and everybody wants our science. We're the coolest things on the planet now. So he's got a PR machine that is just out of sight. Okay, M fantastic stuff. Hans Asperger is, in, is inevitably going to be lumped into the category of science, somewhat akin to Joseph Mengele, who did all those horrible experiences on people in the camps. Okay, any science done under the auspices of a Nazi-occupied country was inevitably going to be poo-pooed right after the war. And as a matter of fact, Hans Asperger's work wasn't even translated into English until the early 1980s by Lorna Wing. Now, for those of you who remember those days of 2000 or the late 90s, and remember how when Asperger's syndrome kind of first hit the scene as a diagnosis, you will remember that it was thought of as like this weird, clunky, second step cousin to autism. But imagine how much further we would be in our knowledge of all this stuff if we could have heard about Asperger's work right from the get-go and we would be so much more accelerated to understand how diverse this condition actually really is. So then we come to the 1950s. And Kanner's belief that intelligence lies within the autistic brain is eventually discounted. I had asked you to remember that he was initially looking for high intelligence, okay? Obviously, we're getting into the doctor territory of it's not there because I can't see it. And for 10 years or whatever, they've been looking for it, and they haven't found it yet. So they have to say, Leo, sorry, we tried. They don't say, we couldn't find it. They say, it doesn't exist. And only today are these ideas being revived. So Kanner also starts to think that placements outside the home would be better for autistic children. This is very early on in our inception and our understanding of what all this autism stuff really is all about. So why not? You know, get them away from dumb, dumb parents. You know, parents can come and visit. No big deal. You know, we'll, you know, put the kid into, you know, one of those programs where um, we might find some stuff, you know, um, and be able to monitor them and learn from them, you know, with increased hours. But... It wasn't until the 1960s and early 70s that we took this idea a little bit too far. And I'd like you, if you wouldn't mind now, to focus on, we're about to start the first of two periods that really destroyed our ability to fairly consider words like autism and Asperger's syndrome without immediately coming to the conclusion of a giant negative in our subconscious minds. Okay, it's not like it was a big woo, woo mental trick or anything, but we just had bad history. 
And this is the first of two periods in which things went really, really bad. And it starts with this guy's name, Bruno Bettelheim. Um, not that I can see you that well, but can I see a show of hands of people that actually have heard of Bruno Bettelheim? Okay, not many. The oldsters like me, they are, they're all raising their hands, you know, but some of the young kids are doing it. All right. Um, before I tell you who Bruno Bettelheim was, let me tell you about the fact that back then, clinical professionals could be rock stars in American society. They can't anymore. They all fight over, they're all authors. They're all speakers, like people on the spectrum. We're all authors, we're all speakers, okay? Um, but in the 60s and 70s, um, there was like, let's say in the 1970s, there was a guy named Benjamin Spock. And Benjamin Spock's theories on child rearing were just thought of as you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread. But Benjamin Spock, I would say, was the number two rock star that we've ever had, and Bruno Bettelheim was number one. And by rock star, I really mean that whatever you say, the American public is going to buy hook, line, and sinker. Absolutely. You can say the craziest stuff on the planet, but we will buy it because you're our number one rock star. Bettelheim was that. He was also, he was actually a Dachau survivor, and he was originally from Germany. And he, you know, sort of, did a little bit of piggyback on Sigmund Freud for really contributing to that stereotype of the German accented clinician, you know, with the white robe, you know, the Bugs Bunny cartoons and, you know, the large library behind him and, and what have you that we always saw on the really old 60 minute episodes about stuff like this. Um, and Bruno Bettelheim focused on autism and he had a theory about where you got your autism from. And no, it wasn't vaccines and no, it wasn't genetics. Bruno Bettelheim believed that you had autism and this is back in the day when the prevalence number was one in 10,000. You got your autism because your mother wasn't affectionate enough with you right after you were born. Now, um, for the, anybody ever heard the term refrigerator mothers? Yeah, this is where it comes from. It comes from the Bettelheim generation. So I think, yeah, I would say this audience is, you know, predominantly women. So probably a lot of you are immediately thinking of, what if I was that mother? And thinking in my head back to the moment right after my child was born, and you're thinking, that's crazy. That's nonsense. I was totally affectionate enough with my child right after he or she was born. That's bonkers. Here's the problem. If the rest of the United States of America believes that, no, you're wrong, you caused your child's autism because you weren't affectionate enough, you were wrong, don't lie. Um, inevitably, who are you to you know, feel as though you're gonna have the strength to be able to fight back such incredibly unified society-wide pressure for you to capitulate and say you're sorry, this was your fault? Because we're not, I don't think we are that strong. Now, since, you know, that's horrific enough, and maybe it's going to be really kind of hard for our imaginations to move past that, but let's try, and let's think of the partners, okay? In most cases back then, definitely the husband, okay? Um, what does the partner interpret here, okay? Because they don't doubt Bruno Bettelheim either. This is my wife's fault. She did this. What about siblings? Oh, don't expect any affection out of mom. Look what she did to my brother. This man, in the most economically solvent nation on earth, destroyed thousands upon thousands of families. And this is our legacy. And I don't care how progressive you think you are. This is our inheritance. And it takes effort for us to be able to work against the thinkings that inevitably were going to be instilled in us thanks to this man and this period that we come from. So the iconography of autism under Brutal Bellheim has, says a lot of things. There's a suggestion of bad mothering, that's for sure. There's strongly suggested separation, okay? Canner, you know, was talking about, you know, getting the kids outside the home. Well, now we really entered the time in which parents were told, put him in a home and forget you ever had him, okay? Now they don't even want the parents to visit. 
And the homes that those kids are going into are not full of really intellectually satisfying things to do, okay? A lot of them are bare rooms, nothing going on. And this is where, you know, some of our just Kafka-esque, just draconian period of institutionalization really is starting to go, in, go haywire where, you know, people are just, you know, sex toys for the orderlies and, you know, people are conducting experience, experiments without any permission, not horrific, you know, mind-bogglingly painful ones where, you know, like it's not Joseph Mengele land, but there's a fascinating um, a, a quasi-journalist named Geraldo Rivera made his name from a, uh, a brilliant, actually, story he did do in 1973 on one of those residential institutions in Staten Island and for some reason, I'm forgetting the name of the institute, Willowbrook, Willowbrook. Um, it's on YouTube if you're ever interested in it and it's horrific, horrific stuff. Um, we have a very, very dark history. Remember the stuff we just talked about with the versives, okay? It's still kind of going on. We have a very, very bad reputation and relationship with these institutionalizations, okay? So, Logical then to avoid the diagnosis of autism, right? This is a bad thing that's going to happen to your family if this happens under the Bruno Bettelheim generation. And oddly enough, you will steer, still hear whispers of support for Bruno Bettelheim. Um, Oliver Sacks, rest in peace, um, used to drive me crazy a little bit because um, for those of you who don't know, when you get a diagnosis, the last two paragraphs are the things that say uh, this individual has autism or this individual has Asperger's syndrome, bling, what have you. Um, but it's, there's pages and pages before that of observations. And Oliver Sacks, I just wanted him to, I was like, shut up, Oliver, please, you know. He had to feel, like people had needed to know that he thought Bruno Bettelheim was brilliant at the observations part of it. So you still hear a little bit of that. And we got turned down for a grant um, a long, long time ago because we approached this one foundation. And we don't go out of our way to slam Bettelheim. It's not, you know, in our grant proposals, but... Um, you know, we had something along the lines of, you know, now that we're past the Bettelheim world and blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, the board of directors of this foundation, they were old friends of his, so we didn't get the grant. <laughs> okay, so now we come to the late 1970s and 1980s. I'm sorry, I'm not used to working with a microphone. I'm like, just like, you know, trying to, what do you do with this thing? Go away. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm used to like, I'd be all over the stage if I didn't have this thing in my hands, I promise you. Camera guy's probably really happy. That's why you had me hold it. You don't need the audio. You just wanted me to stick around in one place so you weren't whiveling, swiveling the thing all over the place, were you? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, so the first period ends, and suddenly a magical thing happens. We get it. Oh, yeah, Bruno Bettelheim was an idiot. Oh, stupid us for believing it. That was a pretty cockamamie theory he had. Wow, what was wrong with us? Holy cow. So now we're going to go in the opposite extreme direction. Okay? We're going to create a movement to completely overthrow the Bettelheimian way of looking at autism. Completely overthrow it. Usually, movements take time to surface, whether it's a suffragette movement or an anti-war movement. They usually take time, but the movement, even though it wasn't even conscious, to overthrow the Bettelheimian way of thinking about autism was pretty much overnight. And suddenly what you started to hear from a lot of really well-intentioned families was this. I don't care what my kid has. If I love my kid with everything I've got, everything is going to be fine. And that's what started to happen in this generation. And this is when you started to hear this phrase. Why do you want to put a label on him? In other words, labels are bad. Diagnoses are bad. Um, this is a phrase that New York got rid of a long time ago. And I got to tell you, I still hear it every once in a while here in my 18 months so far in Wisconsin. Um, and it needs to go. While we're not going to say that this movement, again, was conscious, we're going to give it a name, and we're going to call it anti-labelism, okay? Suddenly labels, diagnoses, doctors, they're bad. Couldn't be worse, okay? And in essence, what's starting to also happen is that, you know, parents aren't even taking their kids to get them diagnoses. They're just keeping them at home. Obviously, they know that something's different and that the kid isn't going to be able to go to a regular school, and the state understands this, and we'll hand them a check. Uh, but doctors, no, 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 no. Suddenly diagnosis is thought of as something that will rob you of the potential to be an individual. 
It is the cold, stigmatizing mark of something broken. And the iconography we get first off is this is when we start to use intentionally vague descriptions of all diagnoses as quote unquote special. This is around the first time when we first start to use this word, whether it's special Olympics or special education. And oddly enough, at the time, it's really, really wonderful because almost all the words that were being used at the time had negative connotations to it. And this was the first word that actually had a positive you know, connotation to it. So it was a major, major improvement in terms of the PR about all this sort of stuff. Uh, I would argue, however, though, that not because this word has changed, but because we've changed as a people, that this word is now actually kind of condescending and we need to get rid of it and we need to find a, an alternative for it. I don't have one, I'm not that smart, but I'd love to see it go. go. By keeping the aura surrounding the individual undefined, no one could prescribe anything harmful to the family. Again, the key word here is vague from the first bullet, okay? If I'm that mom or if I'm the head of that household and I'm thinking, if I keep it vague, nobody can diagnose anything, nobody can take my kid away from me or pressure me to put him away into a home, and nobody can imply that I gave my kid this because, you know, of anything like that. So this was the new strategy and this was the direction that we all went. The question is that you have to remember, this is a movement that is directly trying to be the exact opposite of the damage that Bruno Bettelheim brought about. And the question is, was this actually a new movement, this second of these two horrific periods, actually did it succeed in being different, different than the Bettelheim generation? Did these two eras really contradict each other as much as the anti-labelists hoped? And I think the answer is a very comic, tragic, no, absolutely not. Both of these periods prevented individuals from having a say in their care, denying self-advocacy, if not the concept altogether, okay? In both of these two, you know, periods, nobody's telling the individual what they have. Nobody's teaching them about autism or Asperger's, um, and that's if they're being told at all. Uh, one of the things that um, I, sh I should have mentioned, actually, too, I work here as a school consultant, and I worked for... Uh, the New York City Public Schools on a contract that I had on the side for 10 years before coming here. Um, there's no appropriate executive directorships for me here in Wisconsin, so it's all school consulting and writing right now. But my main objective when I work in the schools is to make sure that the kids know fully well about what they have so that by the time they graduate, they can look somebody and shake them in the hand and disclose the fact that they have autism, not as a sad sack, but as somebody who's an emotionally strong, confident individual. And I'll tell you right now, because with some of the resistance that I sometimes get in the schools, let me just detract from the subject very briefly um, and tell you that if a kid, maybe it's one of your kids, okay, doesn't have a word for why they're different than everybody else, because I promise you, those kids, they may not articulate it to you, but we get it that we're different. We get it very, very clearly, okay? And if it's not working out with our peers the same way, and if we don't have a word to explain why it's not working out, inevitably, the human element will cause us to interpret that reason as being that we are second-rate human beings, that it's about our character, not our wiring that we're nervous people like our neighbors think of us as, or, well, he's just got to, you know, man up or what have you and stuff like that. Um, you know, and that's going to lead to bad stuff compared to if your kid knows what they have and is able to understand where those things come up. And first off, it's also going to remove the social anxiety about learning about things like socialization, like job skills, and they will learn more about who they are because they don't feel as threatened by it anymore. So thank you for letting me detract. So both of these um, generations basically attach negative iconography to words like autism and Asperger's. And again, I rephrase, I, I'll reiterate, we may think that, you know, we may vote commie pinko in the voting booth every time we go vote on election day, okay? This is still this idea that we have to think of developmental disabilities as something cold or broken or wrong. It's in our DNA. And it takes work for us to get this out of our DNA. 
So the seeds of where we are really do begin in the 1960s when we had first autobiographical accounts by people like Donna Williams and Temple Grandin and Thomas McKean. And this challenged the idea that all autistics were incapable of communication. They're capable of communication. They're writing books. That's communicating, right? And then we had clinicians like Oliver Sacks who brought the world's attention to the beautiful works by autistics. Um, now, granted, um, I don't have any savant abilities. I'm really not that smart. But it was a great thing at the time for Oliver Sacks to be able to bring um, somebody on the spectrum who had this kind of ability into a helicopter and take a helicopter ride over a city skyline of a great metropolis. Okay, and then bring that kid back, and if that kid was one of these kind of people, that they could render a charcoal drawing in an open room of that skyline after having just seen it once. And that skyline that they drew was to perfect mathematical proportion as to the actual skyline. Okay, he brought people's attention to people like that a lot, and it added a cool dynamic, even if unrealistic, to the autism spectrum, which we really needed at the time. And then we come to the 1990s, which is easily the most important decade in all this stuff. And oddly enough, I've been talking a little bit about 1994 and the DSM-IV, and when that came out as being this big moment. But in this particular decade, it actually kind of started here in 1993. And it started with an article called Don't Mourn for Us. Don't Mourn for Us is an article that you can find on the internet. It's written by a guy named Jim Sinclair. And Jim is somebody else who has autism. He's got some other things going on in his life as well. And I'll tell you that, you know, right off the bat that um, his article, you know, it's a little angry, you know, and I'm not saying that anything that Jim doesn't know I say about his article. Um, but it brought up a really amazing point, which at the time especially we really needed to hear and hadn't been talking much about. In Don't Mourn For Us, Jim had a message for parents. Parents, he had heard say an awful lot, my child's life is hell because he or she has autism. And Jim said, hey, parent, you know, maybe your child's life actually isn't hell. Maybe if they have a clean place to live and a decent diet, maybe that job stacking boxes for two hours a day that gives them purpose and a reason to get up in the morning, Maybe if they know when and where it's appropriate to masturbate. And maybe if they're just perfectly happy staring at pretty colors for the rest of their hours in their day, that they're actually quite happy. Parents, maybe the problem is you. Maybe because this child won't, you know, continue on at Harvard Medical School like uh, the family tradition, that you're suffering stigma from because the neighbors look down on you and because that's what's more important to you than your child. How do you think parents reacted to that article? They were pissed. They were really, really ticked off. But it started us on the, on, the, on the conversation towards understanding that there is a very different road that everybody in the realm of one person's diagnosis has to go through, okay? An individual who is diagnosed on the spectrum, they have their walk to walk. A parent on the, of, the, of a kid on the autism spectrum has their walk to walk, and it is different than the walk that their kid has to do. Decidedly different sometimes. Grandparents have their walk to walk in all of this realm, and siblings have their walk to walk in this realm. And my hope is that everybody has the guts to walk their walk, as opposed to running away from their walks, which a lot of people do do. Because if there is, and I'm a very pro-family guy, but if there is a very you know, pro-family you know, sort of picture to apply to this new rationale for how to make this work, it's that everybody has the guts to go walk their walks and that at the end of the day, everybody get together for dinner, sit down at the table and share how their walks went and what they were like. And then one year later, we get the dsm 4 and we talk about, you know, all these prevalence numbers going through the roof. Well, going from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 166 was pretty dramatic. And what everybody pretty much knew about at the time was that uh, the inclusion of Asperger syndrome was indeed, you know, this new diagnosis which propelled those numbers, you know, beyond comprehension. And it certainly was a time in which individuals such as myself that never would have qualified for an autism spectrum diagnosis now were suddenly qualifying as well. 
Um, and yes, that did blow those numbers through the roof. However, the definition of traditional autism, which many people really forget, also changed dramatically with this new edition. In the prior edition of the DSM, DSM uh, it was the 3R at the time. In the prior edition, in order to get a diagnosis of autism, you had to meet six mandatory criteria to get that diagnosis. So if you got five, but not the sixth, mental retardation, which is what we used back then, okay? Now with this new edition, you had to meet eight optional in a field of 16 possible criteria to get a diagnosis of autism. So for you math brains out there, you can understand how dramatically that will blow those numbers completely through the roof. And then in the late 1990s, we had more books by people on the spectrum, people like Leanne Holiday Willie, we had Jerry Newport, Stephen Shore. And instead of writing, you know, one, let me tell you how awful my life was and then I'll get out of the way book, you know, instead people are writing second books and third books and, you know, they're fighting over book deals and, you know, it's kind of funny and as well as progressive at the time. And what's really important though is how things are looking like we talked about those old 60 Minutes episodes where you had the German accented clinician. And the difference here was that I think adults were being looked upon for their opinions and not just their experiences. And that was the shift in cultural thinking that w was happening when DSM-4 started to come out. So like in the old you know, 60 Minutes episodes, they would put the microphone on autistic Johnny and they would say, tell us how bad it was, Johnny, tell us how bad it was. And they would shift to you know, the German accented clinician who would say something like, you know, you know, that Johnny's problem has to do with his you know, neurological structure, or something like that, okay? And now, but the difference now in the more progressive time was they would do away with the doctor and they would stay on Johnny and they would say, Johnny, why do you think what happened to you happened to you? And that was a major, major difference. And they dispelled the notion that one size fit all. Some of the people that are my age in the audience, you might remember those campaigns, this is the face of autism. Um, where everybody sort of looked at those faces and looked at those campaigns and thought to themselves, you know, well, my kid doesn't look like that at all. Uh, and now we know a little bit better about how, div how diverse the spectrum is. And the phrase to keep in mind is always, if you've met one person on the autism spectrum, you have met one person on the autism spectrum.